Well, ladies and gentlemen, a couple things before we start. Uh, I had an update. We started about a minute. We're live right now well, because I can't run back and forth. And Tony's moving. in Michigan visiting baby Daniel Yay. Lee. Congratulations. Uh, then she'll go to New Zealand in a couple weeks and visit uh, baby Jude Gary. And then cool. sometime in uh, end of March, uh, we'll have another grand daughter in, in Missouri. So I'll be eight. So she's busy running around visiting the grandchildren that have just been born. So she's excited about that. Uh, last Monday, I updated the, uh, the program I use to do live, and it wiped out somehow, or at least I haven't figured it out yet, uh, my live feed directly into the video. So we got the, the feed that we're getting is house sound. Usually goes right from the microphone and it can't pick up anything except, you know, maybe, you know, if you get really loud and, and obnoxious. But right now it will pick up anything you say and go live. Uh, the world, well, the world, I flatter myself. <laughs> the three or four people that are breezing by to see if it's worth watching will hear. But just so you know that. And I'm disappointed because it's not as good of a, a feed online. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to work on that some more this afternoon. Uh, another thing, I think I said it on Monday and Tuesday, but uh, at the start of the semester, I, which was Monday or Tuesday, uh, this, I turned in my resignation for uh, teaching school. Uh -huh. So I am, in June 1st, I will be retired as a school teacher. Not Generation Word, not a Bible teacher. We'll continue until Tony unplugs me and says, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Got a couple political comments there, but I'm going to stop avoid that <laughs> until I no longer make any sense. And Tony will be the judge of that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll keep we'll keep doing what we're doing. Maybe do some things a little, a little more. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, it's going to be kind of yeah. it's going to be a challenge. We're already concerned about it. Just you know, in summer sometimes you know they get long and don't get up every day after day. And, and Tony's. Yeah, it's one of those things, it's a serious concern, are you going to be okay not having a schedule? <laughs> and so it's, it's time. And we've talked about it, you know, we made it through, I'm sure we'll be fine as a married couple, but, you know, we were a teenage couple, and then we were a, a young married couple, and we, you know, every, every phase is a little different. Then we had little kids, two, three little kids, and we had six kids, and then we had a big family of teenage boys bringing home girls, and... You know, now we've got grandkids, and each phase is we're quite a bit different than we were. Yet yeah, we're the same when we were teenagers and, and a young married couple. Well, now we're to the place where everybody's gone. We got the same house that we had. We had six boys, and uh, now we just wake up every morning and look at each other. It's we're retired, and it's like, will we make it? <laughs> like we sure we will, but it's, it's going to be yeah, it's going to be a different you know kind of uh, attention or a different type of a, a climate. We're excited about it. Tony's very excited about it, but at the same time, she's like, ooh, we're home every day. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so it, it will be fine. Yeah, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've already gone through that phase. Yeah. So, anyway. Uh, speaking of tests and trials, let's begin James chapter 1. <laughs> hey, what an introduction. What an introduction. Okay. Uh, we are going to try to move a little bit further than we did uh, last couple weeks. We're getting into uh, some more... Uh, of the substance of the letter. We kind of, I think, a fairly good foundation uh, of the climate that they're writing to. They're writing apparently to Jews that have moved north into Syria, in the Antioch area, Damascus possibly, I mean the whole area there. And they found themselves outside of their country because they've been persecuted or chased out through persecution. Maybe around 45 AD is a, is a good guess. And he's writing to Jews, most likely, that are believers in Jesus Christ. Not the, it, it, We call it the church. But it's not the church that Paul's going to be starting in, in you know, Greece and in Asia Minor, in Turkey, uh, you know, Corinth, Rome, that he's, going to, he's not going to start the church in Rome, but he'll meet the church in Rome. Uh, those are going to be developing in the first century. A lot of things are happening in the first century as the, as the gospel is spreading into the Gentile world. This is probably pretty much Jews, and James is writing from Jerusalem up to those people, and they are facing trials. And basically the point of this letter is, you know, Face those trials, grow through those trials because they're taking you somewhere. You're counting on God. And it's a good letter for us today because we're in a climate where we're waiting for our political party or our cultural favors, favoritisms, you know, that we want this to be, 
and it's like it's not necessarily going to work out the way we would want it to work out and have the, the political leaders or the cultural uh, morals and values that we would like to see. And you're going to have to look for something else during these times of trials, and you're going to need to get your eye on Jesus Christ. Uh, you're going to have to follow what God is doing. He's going to have to strengthen you. Now, we know all these things, but the thing is, as, as Tony and I have talked about before, uh, we, we know this, we can teach it, but when it comes down right to you know, your daily life, you kind of lean on you know, the, the, the carnal strength that you have, like you know, your governmental leaders, or you rely on your paycheck. You know, you, you've got a job, you've got a good culture, you've got good political leaders. Okay, everything's fine. Well, you take away the leadership, you take away the culture, you take away the paycheck, you take away, and all of a sudden it's like, oh no! Well, what's changed? You're still a Christian, you should be following Christ, and He's going to be t helping you mature and grow through all of this. And again, I'm not saying those other things aren't necessary, but it's one thing to be a strong Christian when everything's in your favor, and it's another thing to be a growing, strong Christian. Not just bitter and angry, mm -hmm. but be a Christian that's growing and flourishing in a place of trials. And James is basically telling them, he's not saying, oh, poor you, it's tough. It's like, no, this is great. You should be excited. It's not poor you. Good luck. This is an awesome opportunity for you to grow and expand. It's like, what? I don't even understand that. And that's kind of the verse we're going to see today. We're going to get into that. Uh, ask for wisdom. Okay, so here we go. Chapter 1, reading the NIV. I'll read down just through verses 1 through 8. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, hupomone. Hupomone, or perseverance, must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Now, we're seeing in these verses... And, and again, make sure you're judging my teaching. You've got the text of Scripture. You've got you know basic theology you understand, and you have doctrines that you need to hold to. Uh, but you see in this verse some things that God, God is doing. God is going to be doing certain things in your life. For example, He's not a concerned in the fact that you're facing trials because those trials are going to cause you to go into hupomone, which is, again, perseverance, the ability to stand and endure longer than... You know, others would, and that would—that's a word that can be used in sports in the Greek world. It can be used in you know work, laboring. It can be used here in the context of faith, of standing and trusting the Word of God and God's reality, even while others are turning away from it. You're going to hold to it. That's hupomone, and that hupomone, that perseverance, that we'll just say waiting, and that's not waiting passively. It's waiting because you know the strength. It's going to produce. It's a process. It's going to produce. And we know God is doing some things. And, and, and that, that's true, obviously. God is going to complete the work He began in us. But us, we, are also going to need to do something. There's going to be things that we're going to need to do. Uh, even right here, we're going to have to ask. Uh, we're going to have to uh, hold on. We're going to have to, uh, I'll say, understand. And if we don't understand, we, if we need wisdom, we're going to have to do that. So, at any place along here, if we fail, it, it's going to stop the process. Now, be careful right here, because God is doing the work in our lives. But you have to be able to see times in your own life where you have failed, and you didn't proceed, you didn't progress. Or you can see others that are, are saved, and they, they somehow turn away. So, there is a, a, some things that James is encouraging these people. He's not just writing to them saying, oh, you're saved, it's going to be fine. Just keep being saved. It's like, okay, yeah, you're saved, but you need to understand what God is doing if you're going to progress. Getting saved, I would say, is one thing. Being saved is one thing. What we call them the phases of salvation. Uh, the past, the present, and the future forms of salvation. You've got the justification in the past. You've been justified in Christ. You are a believer. You are now in the process of sanctification, theologically calling. The second phase where you are maturing, you're growing, you're starting to understand. You're trying to form the character of Christ in your life right now, today, in this fallen world. <clears throat> Ultimately, in the future, there's going to be the third phase of salvation, glorification. We call that perfection. That's where the Spirit 
which was saved at the point of justification, the soul, which is in the process of being saved now, and then your body, which is going to be resurrected or saved, like the image of Christ, you'll be not the image of Christ, but like the body of Christ, you'll be resurrected for eternity. The spirit, soul, and body will be completely uh, uh, saved. The work of salvation will be complete. We're in the process. Yes, we are saved going to heaven, but we are in the process of being saved. And that is what James is talking about. He's not telling these, he's not evangelizing these people. He's telling them. You need to start cooperating with God uh, so that you can mature and you can be complete. And then eventually there's going to be the completion of, of glorification at the, at the resurrection. And so when we look at this right here, I'm looking at your notes now. Uh, the first three verses that we've looked at, chapter 1, verse 2, 3, and 4, are written out there. We've got the text in the English Standard Version now. And also the Greek. We'll look at the, the, some of the, the words there. <clears throat> uh, it says in, in the English Standard Version, chapter 1, verse 2, count it, meaning figure, do the math, consider. It, it's, you know, it, it's a reasoning. It's, it's figure it out. Uh, it, it means mentally. Look at this from this objective position. Count it all joy. And that ideal is pure joy, complete joy. Not everything is joyful. But you consider this, that this is good. This is pure joy. You are growing. Consider uh, joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And the word trials is going to come up a couple different ways in this, this letter. Uh, but the trials of various kinds. The, the kinds that we're facing here in this letter, we just simply say uh, financial and oppressive. Uh, there's going to be opposition that is crushing these people culturally. They're outside of Jerusalem, they're outside of Judea, they're in a foreign land, and they're amongst Jews, potentially, but those Jews themselves are persecuting the believers. Because, so they're in a foreign land with Gentiles, so they're out of sync, out of their homeland. If they are with Jews, some of those Jews have rejected Jesus Christ and consider you a heretic, or worse, if you have believed in Jesus Christ. And so now you're opposed by the Gentiles, you're in their country, you're opposed by the Jews that are holding to Judaism that have rejected Christ, and now you're opposed. So they're under oppression, and it's going to go into their social life as we know. So there's trials of many kinds, and they're coming at them in a variety of ways in that area. For you know that the testing of your faith, and there's the word testing, is the word dokimazo, and that is a word that means to test for approval. It's the ideal of putting silver, rough silver, unpurified silver, in a bowl and heating it up so that the part that is not silver separates from the pure silver. So that is dokimazo, the testing of your faith. You have this thing called faith. Now again, uh, Peter's going to use the word phrase genuine faith when you translate it. We have this Christianity. This is you know part of its culture, part of its you know what you think you believe. It, and then you're going to get trials. You're going to get pressure. Trials are going to come into this. And trials are the fire. They're the heat. And the stuff that isn't pure, that isn't genuine, that isn't, uh, we'd say, in, in aligned with the Word of God, that isn't supported by the Spirit of God, it's going, to, it's going to fade away. It's going to burn off. And you're going to end up with this core. This is the truth that you believe, and that is the truth that God supports. See, that bigger circle can be a lot of fluff, a lot of things you may think you believe, maybe it's true, maybe it's absolutely true, you think you believe it, but you really don't, and that gets reduced. Or it may be fluff, you got churches that are saying this and churches that are saying that, but when pressure comes, it's like cotton candy, it's, it's gone, There's no, it doesn't help you at all, there's no truth to it, it just makes you feel good, it's like whatever you want to fill in the blank, it makes you feel good. It, I could go on and start creating a list. But this fire of testing is going to burn off the things that aren't true, burn off the things that you really don't believe, and you're going to be left with this solid core that is purified. It is dokimazo. It has passed the test. Now, we all have this large area of Christian faith and ideas, but when the pressure comes, the faults cannot endure. Uh, the things you don't really believe are not going to last. You're going to you're gonna have to build on them. And this is what you've got left. So he says, consider it all joy, because these trials of any kinds are uh, that the testing, dokimazo of your faith, 
produces endurance. Once you have this endurance, hupomone, we'll just write endurance. Once you have this hupomone, and hupomone is the ability to stand under extreme pressure, if someone does not have this, let's just say this, this core of solid values, they're going to give up. They're going to collapse. They're going to compromise and give in. But if you've got, if this has been tested and you have this, you now will be able to endure because that's who you are. You cannot crush that any further. That is your faith. That is the absolute truth of the Word of God that you have taken in. You hold to it. And when pressure comes, all this other garbage falls away. Or the things that you, well, I really believe this. You really don't. You don't really understand it. It falls away. And you're left with what you absolutely, in a sense, understand. You absolutely believe. And is supported by the Word of God. Now the pressure comes. You can't crush that. That's, gonna go, that's already gone through the fire of testing. And it's going to take take you all the way through into eternity, but during life, that is going to be your rock. That is going to be what is solid. It's going to help you endure hupomone and stand. When everybody else gives up and walks away, why are you still standing? I've gone through the fire. And it's not anything, in this case, it's nothing that you've done. It's God's test. What you're going to have, God is going to do this. What you're going to have to do is understand. You're going to have to not run away and just try to live a life that's always avoiding any kind of trials. I just don't want any conflict. I don't want any trials. I just, I just don't want anything to be wrong. It's like you're just running from this fire. God is going to find you. Basically, I mean, God is going to find you and put you in a fire. Somewhere, somehow, he's going, well, let's, let's go to, if this would be a good time to do this, go to 1 Peter, just read it again. Um, First Peter, I mean, I think Peter's saying the same thing. First Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 3. And think that this is the beginning of Peter's letter. Think about the same example right here. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade kept in heaven for you, who through God's faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation. So what he's saying right there, that's ju justification. You are in Christ. Jesus has died. Your sins are paid for. You are in Christ, and you are kept there until the day of salvation. You're there. That's phase one of salvation. Congrats. You're there. You should be happy. Uh, <clears throat> verse six. In this you greatly rejoice. I'm a Christian. I have hope for the future. I'm going to be in heaven. You cannot separate me from Christ. In this, you greatly rejoice. But look at this. Though now, for a little while, and that little while probably means the temporal world, your little while life. Yeah, but it's been like 80 years. It's a little while compared to eternity. Or you could, in the, if you could figure out the context, maybe it's during, you know, it, it, right before Nero's persecution, then there's some little bit of a, 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 a persecution going on, or, or some, maybe a little time in history. And there are phases in history. There are phases in your life that are more trying than other times. So whatever, if it's talking about your short life, even though it's 90 years, or a moment, you know, a few weeks or some situation. But nonetheless, even now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Why well, I'm rejoicing I'm a Christian, but yeah, why do I got these trials? This is terrible. Okay? And most likely these trials are coming in this context, because of their faith, because you are a Christian. These have come so that your faith that you have of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. Now you can go back to the silver illustration, or the make it gold. You can refine this. Ah, this is pure gold. Yes, but eventually it's going to perish in fire. It's not eternal. It's of this age. Even this pure gold is going to pass away. Your faith, which is of greater value than anything you can find on this earth, because anything on this earth is going to perish in fire. Uh, you're, because your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be, here it is, may be proved genuine. Now, in my NIV, it's the word 
proved, I'm not sure what, what you have there for the word proved, but that is the word dokimazo, may be proved, may be tested. Your faith, it's of greater worth than gold, but it's going to be tested so the hardcore solid part is what's going to remain. Just like silver is tested with fire, gold is purified with fire, your faith is going to be tested with trials so that when you're through that trial, you have something that is absolutely true, that's in your heart, that you believe, that God has approved, that you believe it can't be taken from you. Now listen, without the trial, you may study and study, and you may fellowship and fellowship, and you may confess your faith, and you may sing songs, and you've got all this big repertoire of, of Christianese that you live in. It's like, how much of that do you believe? All of it. Okay, here's the trial. Oh, no! And your whole world starts falling apart. All of a sudden, you maybe don't trust God as much as you thought you did. You maybe don't, it's like, or the thing that you thought was true, that can't be true. For example, God doesn't let his children suffer. And all of a sudden, you're suffering. How is this? Well, that's a false doctrine. We're going to burn that out. All of a sudden, that doctrine, now there are people that hold to that. Well, then you're going to have a huge problem when you come into a trial. I'm a child of God, and I'm suffering miserably. Well, maybe your doctrine's wrong. Hmm. Burn that off. Or maybe your child of God says, I'm, I'm able to endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. And all of a sudden, you're falling apart at, you know, a fender bender. You know, it's like, or whatever. I, you know, again, I use these illustrations not because I am the man that have, it's like, because there are things that I fall apart with that I'm still disappointed in. You know, it's like, I find myself, we all do. It's like, I'm a man of God, and all of a sudden, it's like, I, I, I have, I've lost all confidence. I, it's like, my whole life is falling apart. It's like, well, last night in Bible study, you're like the man teaching. Now, the next day, you see. So, I mean, this is not like me telling you. This is me telling us. This is what God is doing. Okay. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved, may be doki mazo, may be proved genuine, and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So there's going to be, this, the faith that you have is going to result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And that revealed is probably eschatological, when he is revealed, when he appears in the universe, in the atmosphere, in the temporal world, he appears for his kingdom. Uh, it's going to result in praise, glory, and honor. Now that could be praise, glory, and honor to Jesus Christ. So look what he did in your life. But most likely this is praise, glory, and honor because you've received, you've become a believer and you've passed through the test and you're going to receive praise, glory, and honor from Jesus Christ for having accomplished these things. And you're only going to get that if you go through trials. Uh, it says, verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, here it is, the salvation of your souls. You're receiving the goal of your, well, I thought we were already saved. Spiritually, you are saved. But now your mind is being renewed. If you call mind and soul the same thing, you're in the process of renewing your mind. You've been saved spiritually. You have the life of God. Today, you are sons of God. But your soul, uh, it's sometimes following God, sometimes back to you don't, your soul is being saved. Your mind is being renewed. You're not going to conform to the world. You're going to be transformed. That transformation is taking place now. I'm not, in a sense, being born again as a transition. I was born again saved at this moment in time. But my life now is this transitioning of my soul is being renewed day by day. I'm becoming more like Christ. And Peter's just basically saying, you can see the same thing. Uh, and then he goes on, I, I can obviously teach through that, but I'm going to quickly get out of 1 Peter, go back to James before we forget where we're at, go back to the notes. Okay. <clears throat> Count it all joy, figure it, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith, dokimazo, produces steadfastness, hupomone. So dokimazo produces hupomone, the ability to stand when everyone else gives up. And let steadfastness, now this is interesting, and let steadfastness, or hupomone, have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking anything. Now we're going to look at this line right here, this verse right here. So you're going to say, let, and you want to see the Greek right there. Let hupomone, hupomone, teleos, 
Uh, and then you see right there, the first box is hupomone, right here. The underlying word is teleon, or I wrote teleos, which means this right here, it means perfect, it means complete, it means mature. So you, you be careful because when it says perfect, it's like, well, no one's perfect. Okay, so we're not necessarily talking about perfection. We're talking about complete. You've got the whole package. Or we're talking about mature. Now, mature still leaves room for, you can still make mistakes, but you're mature uh, more than you were when you were an infant or immature. And teleos means all of those things. But also notice, the two. Uh, I got three underlying words in that in the Greek. Notice it says teleon, then the next one is teleoi, and the next word is a word that translates as complete. So you've got teleon again, and then you've got, I'll just write the word complete. So you've got three words there, perfect, perfect, complete. Or you could say complete, complete, complete of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, fourteen Greek words. Three of those are basically complete, complete, complete. So, what's going on here? And endurance, work, it's perfect. The word work is the word ergon. You can see it there. That's where we get our word energy, ergon in the Greek. So, hupomone is doing a work. It's doing a work that is a perfect work. So, hupomone. You having to endure is doing a work. It is causing something to happen. This is, in a sense, the way God's system works. You have a, a trial. You're going to have to endure. And it's a, it's a fruit of the Spirit. It, it, God, the Spirit is going to help you. The Word of God is going to encourage you. You'll be able to stand this, this, this testing. But what's, what's taking place, this is not the goal. Hupomone, endurance, is not the goal. This is important. I endured. Okay, this is a that you could just like put your head down and cry through life and look, I endured. That's not the idea. The ideal here is you're keeping your eye on the goal. You're enduring in a strong way. You're not compromising. And it's not the fact that you endured. It's the fact that while you were enduring, a work was taking place in your life, which is a complete, perfect work that's going to now produce something. So it's not like, well, look, I endured. Yeah, but you were miserable the whole time. You didn't understand anything, and it, it didn't. It, nothing was accomplished. You're not any further down the line. Yeah, but I endured. Endurance wasn't the goal. It's like going out for for a baseball team. I went out for the baseball team. I got a uniform. I was in the team picture. Okay, that was my season goal. Did you play? Ah, I, I just hoop them on it. I just sat on the bench all year. It's like there's supposed to be something you're gonna go you're gonna get a you're gonna go for a team, you're gonna get a uniform, you'll be in the team picture, then you're gonna practice, things are gonna happen, and eventually you're gonna get the game and you're gonna start producing stuff like runs and, and hits and wins and it's like, oh no, I, I was just I was just enduring on the bench. Well, you understand where we're heading with this. Okay, so it says in the English and let steadfastness, hupomone, have its full effect. Now there it is. Steadfastness, hupomone, full is the word perfect, teleos, or teleon here. And effect is the word ergon, or work. So let hupomone have its full work, or effect. And here it is. So that you may be perfect and complete. So when teleon or hupomone has its perfect work, then you are going to be, you yourself are going to be teleon, perfect and complete. Interesting, again, this is James does this a lot. There's going to be the teleon, hup, hup, the perfect work of hupomone, and when the perfect work is done, you will be perfect. I mean, the words are right there in the same sentence. And this perfect is you will be perfect, you can just see right here, perfect and complete. Now, uh, this is talking I, in the context, and you're going to have to decide this, and I'll read some notes here. Uh, the context here, perfect and complete, 
in, in what area? And I think we're talking about the ability to endure, as this book goes on, with Christian character traits. Not turning to verbal insults of those who oppress you, or violence, trying to get even, bring about worldly justice. You're going to be able to have, you will be perfect and complete in the situation and maintain not just having been saved and justified in Christ, you are now going to have your soul is being saved. You're now going to be able to behave in a way that matches your salvation. I mean, this is, this is all of our trouble. This is my trouble. I am a child of God, but I live like a child of Satan. Okay, okay. That's an overstatement, but not really if you get into the text. You are a child of God, but I follow the flesh. I'm born by the Spirit, but I follow my own desires. Okay, you are not complete. You are not mature. I'm going to heaven. Right. That was because of faith in Christ. That's the work of Christ. Now, the Spirit and Christ are doing a work in your life. And you're going to be, when Hupamone has done its perfect work, Christ did the work on the cross and you're saved. Now you're in life with that salvation. And now pressure's going to start coming. Hupamone telling you the perfect work. And when this gets done, you will be perfect and complete in this age. Now again, temper that down with the ideal that no one is perfect. Even Paul says, you know, not that I've already reached perfection. Uh, but you are, well, again, this word talion can mean mature. You will be mature and complete. Now in Paul's writings, this right here, the perfect, the complete, mature, is the word spiritual. When he writes the Corinthians, he's, he talks about being spiritual. And in, the, in our modern church, spiritual means goofy and, and you know, seeing visions and hearing voices and, and swaying back and forth to music that's loud with a smoke machine. You're spiritual. Oh, I just feel so close to God. You do? All right, come. Here's a trial. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. Right, you need a smoke machine and loud music to feel the presence of God. Get in a trial and see if you feel the presence of God. I don't know what to do. Right? You're not complete or perfect. You just got a smoke machine. This right here, when you are, in a sense, complete and teleon, you would be what Paul calls spiritual. Not goofy, not swaying to the rhythm from another dimension, although you are empowered by another dimension. You are understanding the truth and you are living a, a spiritual life when you go to work. You're living a spiritual life when you take care of your family. You're living a spiritual life when everything begins to fall apart and you don't fall apart. You handle it as you walk through the situation, trusting the Word of God. You've got that core of absolute truth that's in you that's been tested. It's gone through the doki module process. You now are spiritual. And you might just look like the, the average person is like, a normal, it's like that doesn't, look, that doesn't look like you've been in church. It's like, yeah, maybe it looks like a truck driver. Maybe it looks like a... A someone that's working at you know their occupation or starting a business or taking care of the family. It might look like a mother at home with her children. It might look like whatever, but they're doing it the right way, facing all these trials. They are now perfect and complete. Does that make sense? I mean, and so again, this idea that with Paul sometimes becomes spiritual. Okay, let's look at some notes here, reading through the notes I've got for chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, point 1, let have, and that is... Ecto, a verb in this form that means let the action and the progress continue. Uh, endurance, hupomone, do its perfect work. Uh, ergon is the word for work. That's uh, always said that. Notice perfect is used again in chapter 1, verse 4. I've write that. I've already pointed that out. There's some notes explaining it to you again. Uh, and I point two underneath that on page 2. Telling them to be mature in time or perfect in eternity. And again, that's something we mentioned before. But you'll become perfect and complete. Uh, this is mature in this age, but again, it couldn't be perfect in the age to come. I mean, it can be in the age to come. You will be complete. So some would say possibly perfect as mature in this age and complete in the age to come. Just talking about temporal and eternal. Uh, you can maybe look at it that way. Uh, it goes on. I didn't read the whole verse there. Let me read the rest of the verse. And, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. A very important line. Lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. 
So this is the idea here. You're going to be perfect and complete, and because of that perfection complete, you are lacking nothing. Now this is important for me right now, lacking nothing. Because when I read a verse that says lacking nothing, it means you can see how, and again, I go back to in the 80s when I was first getting the Bible study, got into some different groups of churches and different people. It's like a Christian is lacking nothing. Yet I was lacking a lot. Young family, working for $4 an hour, going, you know, trying to tithe to the church that needed my tithe to pay for the pa pastor had a jet. Pastor had a jet, a private jet. Uh, and I was making four dollars an hour trying to tie so the pastor could keep his private jet. I was lacking things, but I, you know. But the message was the reason he's got a private jet is he's got faith. He's not lacking anything. Bless God, if you buy his cassette tapes, you too can lack nothing. It's like I did, I did. I kept lacking. I'm not being further behind. And it's like obviously that is a testing of my dokimazo of my faith. And some of the stuff eventually is going to get burned away. It's like that ain't true. That ain't true. So. I mean, I, I remember this verse when I was 25, 26. And I hung on to that, claimed it, named it, didn't get it. But here it is, still there. In the context, what are you lacking? Nothing. You're lacking nothing. You're going to have the character of Christ lacking morals or ethics or the, the fruit of the Spirit. It's not like you're never going to... Because look, at what is the trial? The trial in the context of James is oppression, finances, and being taken down by those with the stuff. And what that point is, if you learn how to follow God, you too can be an oppressor and have all the stuff. It's like, well, that's not the point here. The point is, when people are oppressing you, you're going to be able to, through the trials, grow in Christ, renew your mind, not become violent, not become angry, not become bitter. That would all be works of the flesh. Bitterness, rage, envy. I wish I was that. I wish I had that. Why does he have it? I don't have it. It's like, that's the works of the flesh. Love, joy, peace, patience, kind. And again, we're not talking about laying down. We're talking about finding an inner strength to continue to live your life and produce Christ's character. Lacking nothing, I think, is in context there. I think I've got it written down. Um, yeah, lacking. Point, yeah, here's the, oh, this is perfect. Point page two at the top, point three. Lacking, and you see where it's from, the, the Greek word, means to leave or to leave behind. You've been left behind. The ideal is to fall behind in a race, to fall behind in some, in some standard, to be in want. And so if the, the race, lacking, means to fall behind. If the standard is the finish line, and I start running, and others are running to the standard, and I'm not getting to the standard. We're not talking about having a jet. We're not talking about finances. We're talking about, this is, you're supposed to be Christ-like, and you're lacking. I'm back here being bitter and, and, and thinking we should have violence and, and whatever. It's like, you're lacking. You, you, that's the standard, and you've fallen way behind. You're getting beat in the race. Not necessarily a competition, but you're not achieving the goal. You are lacking. You've been falling behind in your Christian character, in your Christian life. You're saved, but you're lacking because you're not facing this hupomone, you're, it's not producing. But when you do faith, allow hupomone to take place, you will be mature, it, it will do a, a perfect work, and you then will not be lacking, will not be falling behind. Uh, point two there, it says, uh, this most likely refers to morals of the believer, Christian character. And when I say Christian character, I almost want to go back and redefine that again, or at least separate that, because Christian character has come to mean... Uh, Love, which means tolerance and put up with everything, never confront. Okay, now listen, if we're going to be Christ-like, you understand, Christ confronted anything that wasn't true. The apostles, they all died because they were confronting their culture. They held to the truth. They were not like wishy-washy, nice people that didn't cause any problems in the neighborhood. They started churches in the neighborhood and began to separate people from the culture and calling the culture to Christ to be conformed. And uh, they were, uh, I don't want to say rebels because that again has the wrong concept. They were out of sync with their culture. They're going a different direction. And for them to stop and say, you know, I need to have more Christian character. I'm going to get along with all these people. I'm going to compromise. It's like, well, wait. 
That's exactly what Jesus in, it criticizes the churches of Revelation for, uh, was their compromising nature. They began to compromise so they didn't have to see. You can avoid tests and trials in many cases by just compromising. Just don't go there. Just, just don't confront the culture. Good. I'm going to be Christ-like and just hide in the culture. It's like God has called us to be out and be a light. And you start shining the light, uh, people aren't going to like the light. We can read that in Ephesians. And you're going to have opposition. So when I talk about Christian character, that's not like love, tolerance, and put on that happy smate. We already talked about that, you know, the smile. <laughs> You know, kind of pure joy. It's like, no, you've got joy in your heart because you know this is producing something. You may be sweating, you may be miserable, but you are growing and you're joyful because I'm heading somewhere. Something's taking place in my life. It may not be pleasant. Point three, not lacking then would mean, in this case, not falling short of any Christian standard. This is the maturity of the believer who has grown to the place that they will never be lacking in moral standards in the face of this opposition. Uh, and that's, that's the context of what lacking nothing. They're not going to lack in their Christian character. Or they're not going to be lacking in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. So in this sense, this verse uses the concept of perfect three times. Hupomone must perfect its work. The believer will then be perfect. And the believer will be perfect or complete, not falling behind in any standard of Christ. And that, I mean, does that make sense? That that is what James is concerned about, that you're not going to fall behind in the nature, the character of Christ in your life. Not like, well, you're not lacking any finances. Because their their trial is they don't have finances. But if you learn to deal with it, and it, I've heard it flipped. You don't have right now, but you learn to endure, you'll get it on the flip side. It's like, uh, God is concerned about our needs, obviously. You know, we pray to God that He created the world. But that, that is the goal of the Christian life, is not to have stuff. Uh, but part of Christian life is going to God and asking for provisions. Okay, chapter 1, verse 5. Now, with that being said, and again, you can judge how I presented that and say, I don't agree with it totally. That's, that's, that's healthy. Okay, that's, that's called critical thinking. We're not brainwashing. I teach, I critically thought through this, and I'm limited in my ability. The Word of God is true. You look at that and you critical, an, critically analyze it. Not, you know, Galen's an evil person, but yeah, I don't. I see something else. You maybe I've overstated something. You critically fix that, and that's 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 important. Uh, okay, but nonetheless, chapter one, verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, with this after that presentation, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. So, notice right here, just like we went through teleon and teleos, perfect, perfect, in the verse before, that verse 4 ended with the word lacking. You will not be lacking in any of this character traits. But the verse 5 begins with what? If any of you is lacking. <laughs> See, I mean, it's, it comes right back. It, it, James does that a lot. He says it. And then says it again. It, it's it's uh, there's a word for it. You just you use the same word. This is you're not lacking. Uh, I'll just say morals, Christian morals. You're not lacking anything. Now, if you don't understand that, and now you're lacking wisdom. You're lacking wisdom to understand this process. Now you need to ask God. Ask God. The morals are going to come if this is the correct interpretation. The morals are going to come through the testing, the hupomona. You're going to be complete on the other side. Now, if you're struggling with this, I, I, I don't understand this, I don't understand this trial, then ask God, and He will give you wisdom. If you're lacking wisdom, now, some things about this. Oh, yeah, I've got to show you this. You see that very first word in the Greek? It's epsilon iota, or if. You see it right there, E-I, in the transliteration. That is the word if. It is the first class condition. Which means James is assuming that this, this will be like, this is, well, how can you say that? I'm just telling you what the Greek says. And what this is James writing. You don't judge me, judge James. Because this is in the first class condition, James is assuming these people are lacking wisdom. It's first class condition. I'm going to show you some of this, and you've already seen it before. It means if, and I know you are, lacking wisdom. 
So he, he comes in this he comes into this book fast and furious. And James, to you, twelve tribes scattered, greetings. Now, consider it pure joy when you face trials, because the testing of your faith produces uh, 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 testing hoopamone of your faith produces uh, endurance. It produces the ability to see these things through. It produces character. And, and it must finish its work, and when it's perfect work, is that you'll be perfect. Got it? No, you don't, because you don't understand it. You need wisdom. So you need to ask God, because I know you're all thinking, that's not the way I'm looking at it. He's looking at it. You can't imagine that you do what you want, but you can't imagine these people being chased out of Jerusalem because of Jesus Christ. They've, they've, they've accepted Christ. They're in what they call the church. They're Jews. They've been rejected. Now, not all of them are, like, mature. We are now pursuing God's purpose in our lives. and we're being, It's like, what the heck? I lost my job. My parents rejected me. It's like, I wish I hadn't. Some are having probably second thoughts. Obviously, you. I mean, yeah. Think about a group of a population, not just three or four people, not just the leaders of the church. Some of the leaders of the church stayed. James stayed and faced the persecution. These people ran from the persecution. Apparently, they've been scattered, and now they're in four lands facing persecution. And not all of them are. It's 45 A.D. We're saying, so the church is 15 years old. The disciples were are still processing if you can allow me to say that. They struggled while Jesus was face-to-face -face teaching them. The Holy Spirit came after the resurrection. They grabbed a hold of some things. But Paul is yet going to have to rebuke... It hasn't even come to the point now where Paul has to rebuke Peter because Peter's gone back to the Jewish law. And Peter's one that led the church out of the Jewish law. And But Peter doubles back and joins back up with the legalizers. And Paul has to reject Peter in front of everybody. It's like, Peter... We can't go there. And he has to explain as a rabbi to Peter the fisherman, not so. And both of them are in rebellion towards the Judaism. So just with that being said, and that's going to take place 48 AD, in two or three years or a few months. So this group of people is not like, if Peter's struggling, these people are, are struggling. I mean, they're not, don't, don't think these are the elite Christians. These are the early Christians, and they're, they're struggling. James says... If any of you lacks wisdom, and in the first class condition it means, if, and I know you are, lacking wisdom. You do not understand what I just said. You do not have the ability to process this. You do not have maturity, and you are not complete. So ask God for some wisdom. So and it's not like, he's not writing poetry. He's a great writer, but you've got to think of this, I, I think about this, more like a coach at halftime. It's like, I, that's my image. It's not like, it's not like he's up there reading poetry to the church. He's more like a coach at halftime. It's like you think you're playing hard, but you're not even giving it a hundred percent. If you start playing hard or whatever you're going to say, and you, you reprimand the team because victory is out there for you, but but you're not even trying. You don't even have okay. Going on now, the next part of the notes right here, I just it says recognizing the conditions of if or E-I, Epsilon Iota, in the Greek. There's, that just explains in the Greek. If you turn to page 3, here there are four. This is something you say, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> four classes, conditions, conditions of if in the Greek. Okay? And here they are. And, and you can see the, how, the, the, how the language lines up. The first class condition is the viewpoint of reality. It means this is what if, and it is true. So, for example, these are all ifs in the first class condition. I've got four of them written down there. Um, Paul writes, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. That is not if you are led. It's if and you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Or John 14. Jesus says, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. If and you really do, you would know my Father as well. Satan says, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Satan is saying, if you are, and I know you are, the Son of God. He's not saying if. I don't know what to think of you. John the Baptist, you got this Peter guy, you've got Jesus. I'm not sure who you are. Show me. Turn these stones to bread so I know who you are. He didn't say it to John the Baptist. He didn't say it to Peter. He's never said it to me. He went to Jesus if you are, and I know you are, the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. 
Meaning Satan wasn't trying to figure out who Jesus was. He knew he was and was tempting him to do something only Jesus could do. Uh, and same thing, Matthew 4, 6. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Those are first class conditions. If, and I know it's true. Or from the viewpoint. Now that doesn't mean it's a true statement. It means from the viewpoint of the speaker or the viewpoint of the writer. It's true. So James is, now if it, maybe you say, these people are all mature. Or a lot of them were mature. What James is writing is, if you need wisdom, and I know you do, you need to ask God. So you say, well, yeah, but there's three or four people there that were heads and shoulders above James. James is not writing that way. He thinks they need wisdom. Second class condition, the viewpoint of unreality. This would be just the opposite. If, and I know it's not true, uh, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. There, woman put oil on it. And he says, if this man was a prophet, and they're not saying, if he was a prophet, he would know. No, he's, they're saying, if he was a prophet, and we know he's not, he would know this woman was who she is. Uh, John, Jesus says, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. He's saying, if you belong to the world and you don't, it would love you. He's not saying, if, I don't know if you are or not. He's saying, if, and I know you're not. That's why the world hates you. If you had, uh, in John 15, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. If I had not come, but I did come. So that'd be, again, all, all this I give you if you will bow down and worship me. Satan, he says, if you are the Son of God, if you will jump, then here he says, all this I will give you if, and I know you won't, <laughs> bow down and worship me. He wasn't like, I don't know, let's roll the dice and see what happens. He's like, if you'll bow down and worship me, and I know there's not a chance in heaven that you're going to bow down and worship me. But, okay, that's the viewpoint, that's the second class condition. Now again, in the Greek right there, there's some, I've got to explain, and you don't need, I mean, if you want to go, you can, the way you figure this out is looking at the position of the words in the Greek and the tenses of the words, and then it explains this. Uh, Third class condition, a viewpoint of uncertainty. This is our if. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, if, maybe he did, maybe he doesn't, I don't know, but if he does, if it perchance happens, uh, the woman that touched Jesus' uh, cloak to be healed, she says, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. If and I don't know for sure if I will be able to or if it will happen, but if I could, maybe I can, if, if it was first class condition, if and I'm going to, or if and I did, or second class condition, if and I'm not going to get there, this was if I can make it, maybe I will, maybe I won't, the crowd's too big, I don't know, if I can get there, then I know what's going to happen. And this is amazing, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all around. It is solid. He will forgive us and just and he, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. But if you confess your sins that's up to you. We don't know. I mean, every every situation, every person it's, but if you do we're not, I don't know if you're going to or not. If you don't you're not going to. But if you do, you are. And that's the third class condition. And the fourth class condition very quickly is the viewpoint of improbability. Uh, again, it, it's not yes or no, it's not I don't know, it's just improbable. But even if you should suffer for what is right, this is interesting, 1 Peter 3.14. Because we, and this, is a, this fits into what we're talking about. And it, we could go there. Uh, the idea is, and this, this is that pendulum. This is that, that, that both realities. Uh, Oh, how do I want to draw this? Oh, okay. If you do what is right, if you do what is right, follow the basic cultural institutions. Individual responsibility, marriage, family, uh, nationalism, government, and, and you are just. You do what is right according to the world. The world knows what's right. They know what, that's why we got court systems. That's why someone can say, that's not fair. Because they know there's a thing. If, if there is no absolutes, no one would tend to say that's not fair. If, if postmodernism were true, no one would be able to say, you would not see people having riots, because if postmodernism wasn't true, what are you rioting about? Because nothing's right, nothing's true. 
but you have a standard. Well, you've got a standard. Well, that, that means there is absolute, and you think you found it. But if you found it, why can't I find it? Or if there is no absolutes, what are you writing about? It's just nothing matters. Nothing makes sense. But everything does make sense because there is right. There is truth. There is reality. And so there are things that we would just write these things, you know, just, uh, goodness. Uh, we can say responsible, you know, uh, supposedly marriage, family. You're a good father. You take care of your family. You're a good mother. These things are what we'd say right. If you are doing right, if you are willing to do right, what is the world going to do? The tendency of the world is if, and we teach kids this, if you live this way, good things happen. If you're responsible, you've got a family, you do good and you treat people just, and you're, you're generous, good's going to come to you because... But sometimes, especially in the fourth generation, and Peter is writing to people uh, coming out of Jerusalem that are in the fourth generation, and he's writing into the Gentile world. Um, if you are in Jerusalem, in Judea, uh, like in Jeremiah's day, in northern Israel, in, in uh, Ahab's day, uh, just and good, being responsible, being in our day, being married and having a family, it's like, it, it, bad could happen. It, it can happen. You can get to that place where this stuff right here, it can happen. It's not normal. If you do right, good things are going to happen. People are going to welcome you. They're going to want you in the community. That's normal. It's possible, but highly unlikely you're going to get bad things from this. And that's what Peter says right here. The fourth class condition is a viewpoint of improbability. He says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, even if you do all these things and this doesn't happen, instead you end up over here suffering, you're still blessed. In the world, if you'll do these things in this age, you'll be blessed by people. That's the way the world works. But things can get twisted. And you do what's right... The world can get so twisted that they will cause you to suffer for being this person. So, what should you do? This is the book of James saying the same thing. He's, he's, he's trying to keep it. You're not going to become like the world. You're not going to now become violent and use your words and oppress people and fight back and become like the world. You're going to continue to do this and trials are going to continue to happen, but you're still blessed because God is overseeing all of this. This is a, even in the world, we can just say, of all the generations, there may be a fourth generation, or there may be someone that's envious of you or something, and you may face bad things. There may be a possibility of this. But generally, people are going to treat you good, and you're going to get good things from acting in line with God's reality. But in the end, God, who oversees all this, is going to reward you for this. Even if you had a moment in time where you were offended or you were oppressed, because of these good things. So that's an example of the word if. And it, it really doesn't mean, uh, we're not sure which way it's going to go. It, it actually means in the sense, it's improbable. I'll use it as an example. And even if it does happen, it's still the right thing to do. Even if you do what is right and bad things happen, you still do what is right because you're still blessed ultimately, not in time, but by God. But he is saying you can do these good things and be blessed in time by people. See, I mean, that, that, is, that is that what makes some of these things... It's not like every time you follow Christ, bad things happen. If you really follow Christ and you have Christian character, the world is going to receive you because you have good things. Now, if you're going to confront their sin with your lifestyle, that's another situation. But generally, you become Christ-like, follow the institutions, good things will happen. But there is, obviously, in James is a situation... And Peter is facing a situation. Okay, those are the four classes of if, and that's always interesting to look at uh, because it doesn't always trans. Hey, Tony does have a clock up there. What time is it? 11.58. I just, a little buzzer went off in my head. It's like, <laughs> it's, all right. Okay, okay, so. Okay, we got to pick this up next week. But I'm, I'm in verse chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, 
Uh, and that is you're, you're now falling behind in wisdom. The race is going on and you're falling behind in wisdom. Let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. The idea there is, is this wisdom, I'm going to pick this up next week, but if you're not understanding what James is saying, and he's saying, if, and you are not, you're, none of you are understanding this, you need wisdom. I think, and this is something you can judge, I think James is using wisdom for uh, the Holy Spirit. Or the wisdom is going to come from the Holy Spirit. This is not more knowledge, this is not more information, this is not become more intellectual. This is you need insight. You need something supernatural. You need something coming alongside of you to show you this concept. So you're lacking wisdom. You could see Paul talking about the Spirit or Jesus. I've got it written down there. Uh, do I have it written down there? Oh. Oh, yeah, I got a whole section on it right there. Oh, my gosh, I couldn't do it so big, I couldn't see it. So, yeah, Jesus says, uh, uh, see. Um, oh, okay, yeah, right there. Jesus says, to ask the Holy Spirit, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And so now, again, this Holy Spirit, now notice they're asking for it. We've got two, two, two interactions with the Holy Spirit that we're going to talk about. We're going to have the time of being born again, the Holy Spirit. To, if you do not have the Spirit, you do not belong to Christ. That's Paul writing in Romans. So everyone who's born again, they've got the Spirit. But then there also has Jesus saying, ask for it. Or in this case, James saying, ask for wisdom, if you can make the connection. Then you're going to have in life. And that would mean this is automatic. It, Holy Spirit comes to you. This in life, now we're not going to talk about, you know, being, you know, the, the whole, you know, the whole Pentecostal experience, but you do have to admit you have a chance to walk in line with the Spirit or walk in line with the flesh. Now, just because you're walking in line with the flesh, it doesn't mean you're not born again. The Spirit, that's why it says, do not grieve the Spirit. So if the Spirit that comes into me can be grieved, that means the Spirit has come to me, and when I walk in the flesh, the Spirit doesn't leave me. He's just grieved that I'm not walking with Him. So this is an absolute, and this would be uh, what we'd say the third class condition of if, is we don't know. And that's got some things pointed out there. Uh, uh, it, it, the Holy Spirit abides in all believers from the, from the time of the new birth and forever. He comes forever. But then i got Galatians 5, 16 through 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh meaning you could walk by the flesh. I will pick this up next week. Or resisting the Holy Spirit, point two. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. See, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit for redemption. You are a Christian. You're going to heaven. You are in Christ. But now in life, do not grieve Him. So you could walk against the Spirit of God. So, I mean, you're saved, but you could come against the Spirit of God. Uh, do not quench the Spirit. The Spirit may be leading you, encouraging you, guiding you somewhere, and you pour water on it. It's like, not going to do that. Oh, no, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Again, there's a whole other topic about that. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Now, and that is the battle. You see, that right there, this is, this is the person. Okay, how, how bad is this right here? Here's the person right here. And you've got the Holy Spirit, and you've got the flesh. And, uh, he's confused. The Holy Spirit is pulling you this way, and the flesh is pulling you that way. I mean, that, that is, now that person's born again. But you don't, haven't gotten rid of this flesh. What you need is the Holy Spirit. So that's why Jesus asked for the Holy Spirit, or seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And now, the big jump back here. James saying you need wisdom. The whole, you're, you're, you need to produce this fruit of the Spirit, and you're going to need wisdom to do it. Ask God for it. And it says, uh, it's a great line right there. It says, I'll quit. It says, uh, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. If you're struggling with this, ask God. And he gives generously to all. Notice generously. He's not going to hold back. He's not going to run out. He's not going to give you a small amount. To all. I mean, it's like, 
to everyone. If you are struggling and you ask, He's going to respond. This is, this is one of those prayers that will be answered. You just, sometimes God doesn't answer prayer. He's got a different answer. He's got a different plan. This is one of those prayers. Ask God for the Holy Spirit to empower you in life to become more Christ-like. <laughs> Guess what? That prayer is going to be answered. Now, you're going to decide you're going to want to follow it or not, but God is going to provide the Holy Spirit for you to draw you this way to walk more in the line of Him, but you're still going to have that flesh hollering at you. But God is going to do this, and now it's a matter of, now this comes that choice. God, you ask, God will give this, but you're still going to have to make a response. Uh, gives you generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. The ideal of reproach, or without finding fault, it means reproach, and translates reproach, revile, or upbraid you. He will not mock you. See, yours right here. This is you. This is me. I'm struggling. I want to go this way. I, I want to maybe not listen to James. I maybe want to go the opposite. The Spirit is saying, this is the way to go. It's like, I want to follow God, but I'm, God says, ask, and I'll give you the Holy Spirit. You've already got the Holy Spirit, but He's going to give you wisdom to help you see this and go this way. But he will not look at you with reproach and reject. It's like, well, you sinner, why are you having trouble with the flesh? It's like, what? I mean, God's asking me why I'm having trouble with the flesh? I mean, you don't know why I'm having... God knows I'm having trouble with the flesh. God knows we're falling. God knows we're living in time. He's not like, well, what's wrong? I already saved you. It's like, I've been waiting. I know you're having trouble. I know you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble in this age. You better ask for wisdom. You're not going to understand it. And so when you ask for the Holy Spirit, it's like, all right, thank you. It's like a child in my class that isn't listening, and they're struggling, or they're not working, they don't understand, stuff, and they just sit there and get distracted, they pout, they don't do anything. And then I go, like, why aren't you working? Why aren't you doing? And now I'm chewing them out, and all I need them to do is go, I, I don't understand this. Hey, I'm a teacher. I've been waiting. I, I, see, I see a kid not working. It makes me angry. And it's like, the same kid can just raise his hand and go, I don't understand it. Stop asking me questions. Now, I'll get angry if you're not participating, you're not involved, but I'm not going to get angry if you say, I need help. It's like, that's the heart of the teacher. I, yes, thank you. Oh, I get, I'll give generously. I'm going to, yes, I'll even do it for you. Oh, you know, it's like you're engaged. But you're going to just sit there and give me attitude. It's like, we're going we're to have a problem. But you say, I need help. I'm there, right? And that's, that's God. He's not going to, you say, I, I need help. I need wisdom. He's not going to chew you out. It's like, you stupid kid. It's like, yes, he sent Christ to the cross. He created you. He, you know, he's got a plan for you. I want you to let me help you. He's excited. I, I, I kind of know the feeling. You can't see that. I get excited about it. I know the feeling of saying a kid wanting help. It's like, I want to help the kid. But I also have a feeling of the kid that just gives me attitude and I ain't going to try. It's like, that's another story. You see? And now you got to imagine God right here. You're going to walk away from God. Uh, you may have an attitude there, too. All right, I'll pray. Good thing I'm retiring, isn't it? Good thing I'm Get that guy out of the classroom. Okay, Father, do thank you for the chance. Look at these things. We do ask that we would have confidence in your love and your confidence that you are leading us and guiding us and ask that we would, again, come to you for wisdom, come to you with, for help with the Holy Spirit that we may, again, endure and let endurance do its work in our lives that we may, again, become... Uh, Christ-like in this age, not, not just Christianized, but Father, be like Christ that we may be able to overcome this age in a powerful way and do the things you've called us to without compromising. And we thank you for this opportunity and ask that you would empower us in Jesus' name.